And we turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, this morning's Audit Scotland report says that reform of the NHS is progressing, but that major challenges still lie ahead. Nobody underestimates the work that's needed to see services improve year on year within our health service. But the bottom line is that seven out of eight key performance standards have been missed this year. So can I ask the First Minister to confirm how many of these performance standards have seen any improvements over the last five years? First Minister. Of course, in England, under the Conservatives, it's eight out of eight. But let me address... Let me address... Let me address directly the Audit Scotland report. Uh, firstly, for completeness, let me point out some of the Audit Scotland findings that I suspect we won't hear from the opposition today. Firstly, NHS staff are maintaining and improving the quality of care. Uh, secondly, there is a strong culture of continuous improvement in the NHS. There is a continued focus on safety and improvement. Uh, levels of patient satisfaction are at an all-time high in the NHS and there are signs that reforms are having a positive impact. The report also points out that since 2008 there has been an 8.2 per cent above inflation increase in spending in the National Health Service and that health uh, today accounts for a higher pr proportion of the Scottish Government budget than it did in 2008. Uh, as we know in every health service across the developed world Changing population patterns means that there are rising demands on our health service. Uh, however, in meeting these challenges in Scotland, and they are big challenges, uh, I, I think against many measures, we are seeing the NHS in Scotland perform better than the NHS in any other part of the UK. And that is because of the actions we are taking. Increased investment in the NHS, reform, integration of health and social care, for example, the focus on realistic medicine and the work we've done on A&E and are now doing in elective care more generally. So this is tough stuff. Nobody denies that, but we will continue to focus on delivering the investment and reform that the NHS needs and that patients across the country deserve. Ruth Davison. First Minister, uh, Presiding Officer, but the answer, according to Audit Scotland, was one. Uh, in one of the eight key performance indicators, there has been any improvement at all in the last five years. And the reason they say is because this Scottish Government is still struggling to do the basics. And one of the big ones is staffing. Now, Audit Scotland warned two years ago that we needed a new national approach to worse workforce planning. And the Scottish Government promised to deliver one by early 2017. Now, that one then grew to three, two of which we're still waiting on. And the only one which has been published, according to Audit Scotland, isn't a plan at all. And what's more, the auditor makes clear that there's no likelihood of the government being able to produce a proper plan because it still doesn't have the data to do so. So Audit Scotland has been warning about this for years. So why is there no proper plan in place? And why isn't there the data to allow one to be written? First Minister. Well, actually, one of the things that the Audit Scotland report points to is the improving data that we now have, not just in the acute service, but across primary care that allows us not just to monitor trends in the NHS, but also to drive improvements. So it actually is specifically one of the things that the Audit Scotland report points to uh, as a sign of positive improvement. Now, you know, I, I make this point actually uh, seriously because I, I accept the challenges in the health service and I absolutely accept the responsibility of this government, the government that I lead, to face up to and address these challenges in Scotland. But Ruth Davidson seems to want to say that the challenges in Scotland's NHS are unique to Scotland and somehow uniquely down to this government. Now, if that is the case, then she has to explain why under the Conservatives in England, no NHS targets are being met. It's a serious question for the Conservatives. Now, on the specific issue, on the specific issue of staffing, as Ruth Davidson is aware uh, there has been a plan published looking specifically at NHS staff. One of the pieces of legislation we will take forward in the coming session of Parliament, of course, is a bill to enshrine safe staffing yep. levels in law, something that no other part of the UK 
is doing. But increasingly, and you know, anybody who knows anything about how health services are delivered these days knows that you cannot look at the NHS in isolation. So the second and third part of the NHS and health more generally workforce plan will look at social care and local authority staffing as well, so that we bring together an integrated plan mapping out the staffing needs for the NHS, not just now, but in the years to come. That's the right way to do this, and that is what we will continue to take forward. But the final point I would make on staffing is a point I have made before, presiding officer, and I will continue to make it. One of the biggest risks we face in Scotland generally, and in the NHS in particular, is a growing inability to recruit people yep. into our public services. And why is that? Because the Conservatives want to stop uh, or restrict our ability to recruit the best and brightest from other countries. That's one of the biggest risks we face to recruitment. And Ruth Davidson should be ashamed of herself for supporting that. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, if I can just quote a, a little bit at length of what the Auditor uh, General says specifically on this issue that the First Minister has tried to sweep under the carpet. The quote is this, it is not a detailed plan to address immediate and future issues. The Scottish Government is likely to find it challenging to provide any more detail in the next two plans. This is due to a lack of national data on the primary care and social care workforces. The data isn't there and the plan isn't there. And let's talk about one area where that lack of workforce planning is having a real and immediate effect. And that is in primary care. Audit Scotland makes clear that GPs are central to the changes that we all agree, all of us agree, are needed to improve healthcare. But this has been hindered by the continuing difficulties in recruiting and retaining family doctors. And the Royal College of GPs make it clear today, they've written that the SNP government has consistently cut the percentage share of health spending going directly to GPs over the last decade. And they ask, how can hospital targets possibly be met when people feel that they have to attend A&E because they can't secure an appointment closer to home. Does the First Minister have an answer for the Royal College of GPs? Yeah. First Minister. Well, firstly, in terms of uh, staffing, it is precisely because we need to make sure there is an integrated plan across not just the acute health service, but primary care and social care as well, that we are developing the workforce plan in the way that we are. We are doing it in the way that I think Audit Scotland it would advise us to do. And that's why we will continue to take forward that work. Now, in terms of uh, GPs, again, uh, we, Scotland is not the only country that is experiencing challenges in recruiting GPs. That is why we are taking forward a range of different actions from increasing the number of uh, medical training places in our universities to establishing a new graduate entry programme which will focus specifically on general practice and of course rural and remote working. We have seen uh, this year an increase in the fill rate uh, of year one trainees compared uh, to last year. At uh, the, the same point last year it was 65%, it's up to 74% uh, this year. Uh, and we of course have a commitment to increase the proportion of the total uh, health budget going to primary care by £500 million over this parliament, taking it to 11% of the total uh, NHS budget, which again, I think uh, is a greater commitment that has been made by any government anywhere else uh, across these islands. So these are big challenges. It, you know, anybody can stand up here, as Ruth Davidson has done, and point to the challenges. I accept the challenges, uh, but this government is putting in place the actions to address those challenges. And that is what we will continue to do. Ruth Davidson. I'm standing up here calling on the First Minister to honour the promise that she made to GPs a year ago. I'm standing up for GPs who are saying that she has gone back on her words and it's not being delivered. Now, today we've had a report from the nation's auditor saying that health in Scotland is not improving and that huge inequalities remain. That there's been a 99% rise in the number of outpatients waiting more than 12 weeks in the last year alone. The SNP set their own targets to make things better, but they've improved in only one in the last five years. We know there's no long-term plan, even though one was promised for the start of this year, that GPs are being underfunded and that we spent £171 million hiring in agency staff to plug the gaps. Now, yesterday, I met a group of fantastic trainees at the Edinburgh Medical School. What reassurances can the First Minister give to them 
that after 10 years of Audit Scotland reporting the same failings over health by her government, she'll actually have taken some action to turn it around. Yeah. First Minister. Well, actually, the number of points to take on there. Firstly, agency spend in the last year is down, something that is recognised in the Audit Scotland uh, report. We are taking the range of actions to make sure we've got the right people uh, coming into medical training uh, and making sure that we can get them into the NHS, delivering the excellent Sorry. care uh, that the NHS delivers for patients across the country. Again, a reminder that the Audit Scotland report points to the fact that NHS staff uh, are not just maintaining, but improving the quality of care across our NHS. Now, Ruth Davidson, I don't know if she understands the detail of the commitment we have made uh, to primary care. She said, we haven't kept the commitment we made last year. Let me tell her what the commitment is. That over the life of this parliament, we will increase spending on primary care by 500 million pounds, 250 million pounds of that will be specifically in general practice. The reason not all of it is in general practice is that in order to take pressure off our GPs, we need to build wider primary care teams. Exactly. That's the commitment. That will take the proportion of NHS spend in primary care to 11%. That's the commitment we will deliver over the life of this parliament. Uh, and I would say again, that's not a commitment that's repeated by any other government across these islands. But, you know, we come back to the, the, the point here, the central point that we so often come back to uh, when we are discussing public services in this parliament. Uh, this government, the government that I lead since we came to office, have increased the health service budget by three billion pounds, again recognised in the Audit Scotland report. Ruth Davidson stands up week after week uh, calling for action in health or education across the range of our public services. But this is the same Ruth Davidson who would reduce the amount of money we have available for public services by giving tax cuts to the richest people in our society. Presiding officer, it doesn't add up. Ruth Davidson cannot offer tax cuts to the richest while calling for more investment in our public services. The Tory policies and the Tory approach has no credibility at all. So we will continue to deliver the investment. We will continue to deliver the reform. And actually, the most important finding in this Audit Scotland report today is the one that says these reforms that this government is introducing are starting to show the positive effects that they're designed to do. So we'll continue with that focus, delivering for people across the country. Question number two, Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, it's, it's worth remembering that there was a report published a few weeks ago by Professor Jim Gallagher that showed that spending, spending per head of population in Scotland compared to England had fallen as a result, a direct result of decisions made by this government. But I would say, presiding officer, that anyone, anyone reading this report from the Auditor General this morning on our NHS in Scotland cannot be anything but concerned concerned about the budgets and the financial management of the health and social care in Scotland, concerned about the shortages of staff at every level and concerned for the impact of all of this on patients. The report clearly states that the patient experience will get poorer unless the pace and scale of necessary change is actioned and actioned now. When are we going to see that level of change being actioned? First Minister. As any reading of the Audit Scotland report would, would tell you, we are seeing that change happen in the NHS. It's one of the key findings of the Audit Scotland report, uh, one of the, the key points that is made in the Audit Scotland report that we are now starting uh, to see. Uh, the reforms that have been introduced, it looks specifically at integration authorities uh, and says that these reforms are now starting to deliver the change that we need to see. Now, in terms of uh, spending, of course, spending per head uh, of population on the health service in Scotland uh, is 6.5% uh, higher than it is in the UK as a whole, £143 higher for every person uh, in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. And you know, again, this is a point I make frequently, but parties in Certainly my party is government, but all parties have to be accountable for what they put forward. Labour went into the last Scottish election promising less money for the health service than any other party, even the Tories, for goodness sake, represented 
in this Parliament. The fact of the matter is uh, there is record funding going into our health service. There are record numbers of people working in our health service. But as Audit Scotland expressly says in this report, it is no longer enough just to put extra money into the health service because of the rising demand. We need to deliver reforms, and those are the reforms that we are delivering. The reforms, according to Audit Scotland, are now starting to show real benefits to patients across the country. Alec Rowley. But if we, if we stick to the facts, the facts are that we have health boards, we have health boards across Scotland not able to make the cuts to balance their budgets. Those same boards are then borrowing money from the government to balance the books, storing up debt for the future. Prescribing costs are increasing at a level that is not sustainable. Indeed, indeed we now have council tax funding being used to be able to pay for prescriptions through the integrated joint boards. The lack of workforce planning is driving up costs and we're having to use more and more agency staff and locums. The whole thing is spiralling out of control. The Royal College of Nursing Presiding Officer are today calling for clarity on how more care will be delivered in the community and they want to know how staff and the public will be engaged in the development of services, community services, moving forward. Can the First Minister answer that question? First Minister. I, I'm not quite sure which one of those questions uh, Alec Rowley wants me to answer first, but let's take, you know, Alec Rowley says, he says prescribing costs are rising. Prescribing costs are rising in every health service across the developed world, probably across the entire world. It is a feature of the ageing population. It is exactly the challenge that health services here and elsewhere are dealing with. That's why we've got to reform how care is delivered. Now, he asks about how we deliver more care in the community. As I am sure Alec Rowley knows, for the last two budgets, and again, it's narrated in the Audit Scotland report, for the last two budgets, we have taken the very difficult step of transferring money from the NHS into integration authorities so that we bring together health and social care, not just in theory, but in practice, because we know, and again, the Audit Scotland talks about the reduction in delayed discharges that this integrated approach is now delivering, because if we do that to build up social care, then we take the pressure off the acute services. So, you know, I would say to all of the parties in, in Parliament, this is not easy stuff. It's not easy in Scotland. It's not easy in England, Wales, Northern Ireland, or any part of the world. But actually, in Scotland, we are doing some of the necessary stuff that is still being dodged in most other parts yeah. of the UK. We're doing the reforms, we're integrating health and social care, we're transferring the budgets, we're uh, taking the steps around workforce that will ensure that our NHS can deliver uh, in the face of the rising demand that it faces. And that is why, uh, while everything the Audit Scotland uh, report says is important and has to be addressed, the key finding of the Audit Scotland report, in my view, as First Minister, uh, with responsibility for these reforms, the key finding is that these reforms are starting to show positive signs. And that says to me, we stick with what we are doing because we are on the right track, and that's why we keep that focus. Alec Rowley. But, President Officer, I accept, I accept totally that this is not easy. And I think what the audit report says today is we're not doing enough and we're not moving fast enough. It is, it is, however, it is however, important for us to remember that behind all these statistics, behind all these statistics, is real people. So today, we should remember it is about people who are trapped in hospital because they cannot get the care packages that they need in the community. It's also about those people in communities up and down Scotland who cannot get the support from health and social care that they need. And it is for all those people that are on the waiting list. And it is the dedicated staff in our hospitals our health centres and our community care centres that are run off their feet. That's why we need action. Labour will use our debate in this parliament next week to discuss this report further, because I believe we do need a more detailed discussion on the findings of this report. 
after 10 years in government. The First Minister, the First Minister has a choice. She can continue to do more of the same. Or will she publish a response to this report that will tell the people of Scotland how her government intends to tackle these big issues facing our health and social care services in Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, I welcome the fact that we'll debate the report. I, I warmly welcome that. Maybe in that debate, if Labour's position is that the government is not doing enough, maybe Labour will bring forward some ideas uh, as well, rather than simply talk about the problems. The second point is, is this. The whole, the whole point here, which again any reading of the Audit Scotland report will tell you, is that we're not just doing more of the same. We are doing things differently and it's those reforms that are starting to have the positive impact that the Audit Scotland report talks about. And, you know, Alec Rowley says we should do it faster. Well, do you know what? I am absolutely open to doing this faster, but often when we bring forward proposals for change, what we find are the impediments to those change set on the opposition benches because they never want to do they never want to do the tough stuff they just want to get up here and it is it is the easiest thing in the world to get up and diagnose the problems our job and what we are doing is coming up with solutions and i tell you what we will not do we will not do daft and wrong-headed things that we're seeing south of the border. Because of the action we are taking in Scotland, delayed discharges are coming down because of sensible change. In England, we see proposals to use Airbnb exactly. to rent exactly. accommodation from local residents yeah. to get old people out of hospitals. So we will continue to do the sensible, evidence-based things that deliver the improvements in our NHS that we are determined to continue to deliver. We have a couple of constituency questions. The first from Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the A77 was closed for 24 hours over the weekend due to severe flooding. Paul Grant, Stella Lines Trade Director, says, and I quote, it's quite clear from this and other incidents that the current A77 and A75 don't reflect the requirements fitting of a major UK island and freight hub. So I'm afraid that major disruptions and loss of trade could be a feature of life in this region until those responsible commit the necessary resources to alleviate these recurring problems. So I can simply ask the First Minister, will the Scottish Government make this long overdue commitment to the people of the southwest of Scotland and duel the 75 and 77? First Minister. Well, we have got a, a range of improvement uh, plans uh, for our roads in the south of Scotland, as in all parts of Scotland. Uh, I'm sure all members will appreciate there will be times when uh, issues like flooding will result in a road being closed. That is deeply regrettable, but sometimes unavoidable. I will ask the Transport Minister to write to the member uh, about the specific issue he's raised in more detail. Uh, but I think uh, anybody looking at the, the record of this government, in fact, the Greens often criticised for it, would say that the investment we have made in our roads, improving our roads over the past uh, 10 years, is a good one. And we will continue to do more, including in the South West uh, and uh, the area in particular that the member talks about. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may be aware that the conclusions of the government's review of freight ferry fares due out by the end of uh, the summer have still not been published. Uh, pending the outcome of that review, hauliers in the Northern Isles were told last month that freight fares would be frozen. Uh, a week later, they received notice that fares would indeed rise by 2.9% next year. How does she justify this decision? How does it square with government objectives of bearing down on the cost of living for islanders uh, or indeed support for Scotland's food and drink sector? And does she believe it's right, as Audit Scotland has highlighted, that freight fares paid by hauliers on West Coast routes remain largely unchanged since 2010, but have increased significantly for hauliers serving businesses and residents in Orkney and Shetland? First Minister. Well, of course, we've invested over a uh, billion pounds in our ferry services since 2007. In fact, we've been talking about a particular Audit Scotland report this morning. There was an Audit Scotland report uh, out last week that said, I think, that uh, investment in ferry services had doubled uh, over the last decade. We've introduced new routes as part of that investment. We've also already cut fares for CalMac customers, and we will shortly be doing the same for Orkney and Shetland, something that I know the member uh, will welcome. Uh, so we have uh, tackled underinvestment that that had been the case for a long time and we will continue uh, to do so. And in terms of uh, the ferry fares uh, review, that will be published as soon as possible. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. 
The First Minister will be aware of the gas explosion at a derelict building in Lanarkshire recently, which resulted in the tragic death of worker Pavel Erbanski, who was from Coatbridge. Can the First Minister outline how she will be supporting the investigation and what steps she is taking to enhance health and safety at work regulations in Scotland? First Minister. Well, firstly, I would want to take this opportunity to express my deepest sympathies uh, to those affected by what was a very tragic incident, and particularly for the family of uh, Pavel Urbanski. Uh, the investigation into uh, the death under the direction of the Health and Safety Division of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is ongoing, and of course the family will be kept updated in relation to any developments. It would be inappropriate to comment further while those investigations are underway. Uh, the regulation of workplace health and safety is, of course, an issue reserved to the UK government. Uh, the health and safety executive are responsible for drawing conclusions from health and safety incidents as to whether relevant regulations remain fit for purpose. And I am sure that the HSE will do so once they have completed their investigation into this particular incident. But I'm sure the, the thoughts in the meantime of everybody in the chamber are with the family and friends uh, of the individual who lost their life in this incident. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Looking at today's report and the challenges facing the NHS, I don't think anyone should pretend that there is a, a simple, quick fix that would solve every problem at a stroke. But isn't it, clear, isn't it clear that challenges like recruitment, retention and staff morale will be made worse, not better, if we fail to provide a fair pay settlement for the dedicated professionals providing these essential services who have seen a real pay cut of some 14% over the last five years. First Minister. Uh, yes, that is why this government is committed to ensuring that we do see fair uh, pay settlements for public sector workers, not just in the NHS, but right across our public sector. And you know, again, I, I would say, I, I think uh, we are still the only government anywhere in the UK that, is giving, that has given the unequivocal commitment to lift the 1% public sector pay cap. Patrick Harvey. The commitment has been given to lift the 1% pay cap, but no commitment has yet been given to an inflation-based increase, a real terms increase, restoring the lost value in people's pay uh, that they suffered over recent years. We have, though, heard uh, the SNP's Kate Forbes, the PLO to the Finance Secretary, uh, someone who works with the Finance Secretary very closely, saying on television this week that the pay settlement for the public sector should be at least inflation, if not above inflation. And we've also heard, we've also heard a wider range of voices uh, from multiple political parties accepting the basic green proposition that fairer rates and bans of taxation can raise adequate revenue to fund our public services without resulting in cuts elsewhere and without cutting the pay of public service workers. I don't expect the First Minister to publish her budget today, but does she agree with that basic point of principle that we can provide an inflation-based increase, above inflation increase, without hitting low earners through fairer taxation? First Minister. Uh well, firstly, we have given the commitment to lift the public sector pay cap. Uh, we have not made that dependent on uh, actions uh, being taken by the UK government in the budget, unlike uh, the Welsh government, which has uh, done exactly that. We have said, and I have said personally, that we must seek pay uh, settlements that are fair. Of course, they must be affordable, but they must also reflect the real life circumstances that public sector workers are facing. And of course, uh, that includes the rising cost of living. Uh, we will, of course, and, and in the, this is in the normal course of events, we will confirm the detail of our public sector pay policy when we publish the budget, because we require to know uh, the overall budget that we have available to us before we do that. So that's in the normal uh, way that we do things, and we will continue to, to set out uh, policy in that way. In terms of uh, the uh, part of Patrick Harvey's question that focused on tax, I have again uh, said openly uh, that notwithstanding the party's different manifesto commitments, we require as a parliament to come to a consensus position on tax uh, in order to pass a budget. Uh, I think given the continuation of austerity, given the implications of Brexit that are becoming clearer by the day, we do need to ask ourselves as a parliament how we use our still limited tax powers uh, in order 
to protect our public services and uh, provide the infrastructure that businesses need to thrive. Uh, next week, we will publish a discussion paper uh, setting out some of the options, some of the principles that should guide that uh, decision. And that discussion paper will then form the basis of the discussions we have across this parliament uh, in the lead up to the budget. So uh, I suppose that's a, a long way of saying I do uh, agree with much of the sentiment behind Patrick Harvey's question. But of course, we have to take uh, proper decisions uh, in line with the proper process of budgeting, because unlike the opposition parties, uh, the governing party in any uh, parliament has the responsibility of making sure we can pay for the commitments that we make. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Uh, the government's policy of prioritising full-time college courses has resulted in a cut of 150,000 part-time places. It has deprived thousands of people the education they want and need, particularly women and older people. Last week, the Education Minister sent a guidance letter to colleges with an apparent change in policy that had never been announced publicly before. Can the First Minister tell me, has the policy changed? And if so, when exactly did it change? First Minister. Well, of course, I think uh, the most recent figures show that the majority of college courses were still part-time courses. But we, and this was, this was a commitment we set out in a manifesto. Uh, given the rate of youth unemployment that we faced at the time, we made a deliberate decision, and it was the right decision, to try to increase uh, full-time places yeah. at colleges in order uh, to increase the likelihood of people going through our colleges getting into work at the end of that. And you know what? The proof of the pudding is in the eating because youth unemployment today in Scotland is half the rate it was 10 years ago when we took uh, office. In fact, we've got one of the lowest rates of youth unemployment, not just in the UK, but anywhere across the European Union. So the policy we will ask our colleges uh, to pursue will depend on the needs of the economy at any given time. And that is the basis for the guidance uh, that the minister put forward that Willie Rennie has referred to. Uh, but we've taken the right decisions in our colleges. And I think we see the evidence of that in some of the economic data that I've talked about. Willie Rennie. So nothing has changed, but everything's changed. The, begin, I mean, it's a bizarre answer. Has the policy changed or hasn't it changed? If this was such a success story, why did her minister sneak it out in a paragraph seven of a letter on a wet Wednesday afternoon? Surely if it was a success, you'd be parading it in this parliament. Everyone knows, everyone knows the birth rate at the turn of the century is more responsible for the drop in youth unemployment than any policy of this government. The truth is that it's taken six years for this government to realise the economic value of part-time learners over the age of 24. This is a crashing U-turn and the First Minister should be big enough to admit it. Six years of narrowing the focus has left us short. That's six years of missed economic opportunity. Six years of abusing those in this chamber who dare to question the policy. Will the First Minister, will the First Minister now apologise to the generation of women and older people who have lost out because of this government? First Minister, members. Oh. Hang on a second. Order, please. Order, please. Oh. Order, please. Order, please. I, I'd appreciate if members. I would appreciate if members would listen to the question the and then listen to the, the answer. Thank you, First Minister. Probably the fact that his pals in the opposition benches felt they need to give him so much help there uh, <laughs> suggests they know how fundamentally wrong Willie Rennie is. I will not apologise for the fact that we have youth unemployment at half the rate today than it was when this government took office, nor will I apologise for the fact that we fought an election on a manifesto commitment to maintain full-time equivalent numbers in our colleges, and we didn't just meet that manifesto commitment, we exceeded that manifesto commitment. So these are solid achievements. But you know, the real flaw 
the real flaw in Willie Rennie's question here is that in spite of delivering that commitment to increase full-time uh, students at colleges in order to get more young people into work, the majority of courses at our colleges continue to be part-time courses, open to the very people that Willie Rennie is talking about. So we will continue in colleges and in every other aspect of government policy to take forward the policies that are right for the needs of this country. That's what we have done. It's what we will continue to do. So we've got to have a couple of supplementaries. Uh, Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's daily record has figures showing that a quarter of Scottish councils are already spending almost £9 million mitigating the impact of universal credit. Does the First Minister agree with me that the impact on people left in dire financial straits because of universal credit is morally unacceptable and the idea that local authorities or the Scottish Government should have to pay the price for failed Westminster austerity is a disgrace. First Minister. Well, the fact... The fact that the... The fact that the UK government is refusing to pause the implementation of universal credit, uh, knowing that they are pushing already vulnerable people into debt, into rent arrears, making it difficult for parents to put food on the table to feed their children, is not just morally unacceptable, it's morally repugnant. Yeah. And I think every Conservative should be deeply ashamed of this. Uh, the fact of the matter is universal credit is not working. That is being demonstrated in the pilot areas. I've spoken before about a visit I made to Inverness, talking directly to people who found themselves in these unacceptable situations. Uh, so we need to see a pause to universal credit uh, and we need to see that happen now before any other person has to suffer. Uh, the indignities and the anxieties that so many have already suffered. And you know, again, we come back to this issue about mitigation. Uh, as people across the chamber know, we should mitigate where we can, but we should not have to spend money that should be getting spent on education or health or colleges, mitigating welfare cuts implemented and imposed by a Conservative government at Westminster. The sooner we get all of welfare powers into the hands of this parliament, the better. And, and Neil Findlay. Uh, do you believe that cutting yet more firefighter posts and closing fire stations will A, make our communities safer, or B, put more lives at risk? And if you don't know the answer, have a guess. First Minister. Oh, well, firstly, let me... Really? Sometimes you only have to listen to Neil Finlay's tone to understand oh. why Labour are in the dire straits Absolutely. that they are in. It is shockingly bad. <laughs> Firstly, let me take the opportunity to thank our firemen and women right across Absolutely. the country for the essential and vital work that they do. It's the importance of that work that has meant that the Scottish Government this year has increased the operational budget of the fire service. Uh, there's been, uh, since reform, no compulsory redundancies, no fire station closures. In fact, over the last year, we've seen the recruitment of 100 new firefighters. Uh, but the fire service, just like any other public sector, cannot stand still when circumstances are changing. There's changing risks, uh, changing patterns of demand, changing technology. So it's right that the fire service look closely at how they uh, deal with that, but as they do, the priority uh, of them and of this government is not just in protecting the front line, but in enabling our firefighters to do an even better service for the people of Scotland in the future. Question number five, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the First Minister what progress has been made with the Reaching 100 programme to connect premises that have not received support from the previous programmes for access to superfast broadband? <laughs> the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband programme <clears throat> has been a huge success so far. It has already enabled fibre broadband uh, to be delivered to over 800,000 premises in Scotland uh, and we're on track to meet our target of 95% of premises with broadband access by the end of this year. However, we recognise that many areas still don't have access. 
That is why the Reaching 100 programme uh, will focus on extending super fast access to those premises that will be not, not be reached in the current programme. Uh, we have completed an open market review and public consultation to formally agree an intervention area and undertake an extensive supplier engagement uh, to maximise competition. Uh, we will set out our delivery approach in greater detail shortly, ahead of the launch of a procurement exercise later in the year. Richard Lockett. I congratulate the Scottish Government on its success in rolling out superfast broadband and accelerating the policy given the slowness, the slowness of previous UK governments. Tens of thousands of my own constituents have certainly benefited from the programme. However, I wonder if the First Minister would recognise that the one side effect of the success is the gap between the haves and the haves not have just got bigger and many rural communities have not benefited or received any form of public support. Whilst we await the next programme and the rollout of R100, can ministers consider any other further short-term measures, perhaps working with the private sector, to connect such communities who in this day and age see connection as a utility and not a luxury? And can Scottish ministers also press UK ministers to introduce appropriate regulation, like introducing universal obligations and dealing with the likes of BT, who are charging customers similar amounts every month for widening varying levels of service? First Minister. Well, I am very acutely aware that some premises, particularly in the rural parts of the country, do not yet have fibre broadband access, and that is why the Reaching 100 uh, programme will seek to prioritise these communities uh, through the initial procurement exercise. But in the meantime, the Better Broadband Scheme already offers residents of premises uh, with broadband speeds of less than 2 megabits per second a voucher code that subsidises the costs associated with alternative broadband solutions. And I'm sure all members will want to make their constituents aware of that. Uh, as uh, Richard Lockhead knows, telecoms is a wholly reserved function. There are a range of issues which I think need addressed and we're working closely with Ofcom to ensure that uh, Scotland's particular challenges here are considered uh, and indeed calling for a more regional approach. I do uh, think issues like universal service obligation are important ones, although with the current uh, discussion around uh, a USO being taken forward by the UK government, the problem with that, of course, is it's not delivering broadband at super fast uh, speeds. But we will continue to deliver on our own programme and continue to press the UK government to take action uh, that they need to take in order to deliver the same. Question number six, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to hold to account NHS boards that do not meet their waiting times targets. First Minister. Well, we work with and support NHS boards to improve delivery of waiting times targets. In May, we, for example, announced that £50 million would be made available to improve waiting times between now and the end of March next year. Uh, in August, we also announced the setting up of an expert group uh, to improve the way elective care services are managed across all boards. Uh, Derek Bell uh, of the Academy of Royal Colleges, who will lead that work, was the same person who did similar work uh, that led to the improvement of A&E uh, waiting times. And of course, we're investing £200 million in a network of five new elective and diagnostic centres over the period of this parliament. Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank the First Minister for that answer. And I, I, I'd like to just put out some few things here to help the First Minister so she doesn't have to address them in her answer. We accept hard-pressed staff in NHS Scotland are committed, dedicated and hard-working. And we do appreciate what they do. Saying that failing to reach seven out of ten targets is OK because other places in the UK are worse. It doesn't help people who are waiting for treatment. Making targets easier is not acceptable. And just increasing spending on the NHS won't be solved the problem. Therefore, turning to the Audit Scotland's report, it says previous, previous approaches such as providing more funding to increase activity or focusing on specific parts of the system is no longer sufficient. There is no doubt the situation is getting worse and the Health Secretary was unable to say this morning on Radio Scotland when it would get better. We need transformational Mountain, and inspirational leadership. What is the First Minister going to do to ensure our NHS has the leadership that it desperately needs but clearly lacks? First Minister. Well, we certainly won't do what other governments are doing, and that is privatise the NHS, uh, something that uh, the member will know lots about. But there was so much in, in that, well, I was going to say question, it wasn't really a question, but there was so much in there that it's just wrong. I mean, making targets easier 
One of the things we've done over the past 10 years is make many of the NHS targets tougher. That is part of the challenge we face, and on many of them, uh, while yes, and, and I've never said it's okay that we're not meeting them, we are performing better against tougher targets than used to be the case uh, against targets that were weaker. So we are uh, toughening up many of these targets, uh, in, other in other words, stretching uh, our expectations of what the NHS delivers at the same time as demand on the NHS is increasing. So we will continue to take the action that I've already set out here uh, several times already today, investing record sums in our NHS, making sure there are record numbers of people working in our NHS, but also taking forward the difficult but necessary reforms uh, that will equip our NHS to deal with rising demand now and in the years to come. And question seven, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on whether public sector workers should be given a real terms pay increase in 2018-19. First Minister. Well, as I've uh, already made clear today, the 1% public sector pay cap will end in 2018-19. Uh, I fully understand the impact that increasing living costs and social security cuts are having on working households and we will set out our plans uh, fully in the draft budget on the 14th of December. Uh, we will develop a pay policy that is affordable uh, but also one that recognises real life circumstances such as the cost of living uh, while continuing to support those on the lowest incomes. Uh, public sector workers both in Scotland and across the UK deserve a fair deal uh, and the UK government should follow our lead in lifting the pay cap, of course ensuring that there is then proper investment in our vital public services. James Kelly. Thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, in recent years, the policy of a public sector pay cap followed by the Scottish Government has resulted in 156,000 health service and police staff uh, being worse off in real terms. This is unacceptable and the budget is the opportunity to address that. Now, when this issue was raised previously by Patrick Harvey in this session, we got two minutes of waffle from the First Minister on it. So let me give the First Minister another chance to answer the question. Does she accept the position set out by Kate Forbes in Scotland tonight that the pay rise should be set at at least inflation? And will the government bring forward the consequential tax changes that are required to give public sector workers the pay rise they deserve. First Minister. Well, we will bring forward the detail of our spending plans and our tax plans in the budget that is, uh, will be published on the 14th of December. But the hypocrisy of Labour on this issue is quite frankly staggering because we've said the pay cap will be lifted. We've not made that dependent on actions taken elsewhere. And that is completely different to the position taken by Labour in the Welsh... I've got a letter here. I, no, they won't want to hear this. They will not want to hear this. I've got a letter here written by the Health Secretary, the Labour Health Secretary in Wales, to Jeremy Hunt, the UK Health Secretary. And it says this, and I'm quoting, without a commitment from the UK Government to give the Welsh Government more money, the public sector pay cap will remain. That's what Labour in Wales say. So here's what we've got. Labour call for the cap to be lifted in Scotland. They call for the cap to be lifted in Westminster. But in Wales, the only part of the UK where they've got the power not just to call for things to be done, but actually to do things, Labour refused to give a commitment to raising the public sector pay cap. What does that tell us about Labour? Well, this is what it tells us about Labour. Labour are all mouth and no action. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business in the name of Jeremy Balfour. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.